uh, David Turk, who is the professor and chair of the Suffolk <coughs> University Department of Economics and president of the Beacon Hill Institute, and he's going to be talking actually about, I think, one of the vested interests in this uh, uh, whole whole game. So taking on the the, 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 the discussion of, uh, of public choice theory. So he didn't he has he has, he, has, he doesn't deny public choice. Theory. No, I I, uh, I don't deny public choice theory. Uh, Professor Boudreaux and I actually have uh, similar ideological roots, but I'm going to uh, take a different tack. I'm going to say, as he did, that I have no expertise in climate change, but I'm also going to say that I'm not inherently opposed to status solutions, thus shocking all my Austrian and public choice friends right off the bat. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight, today, is um, a favorite research activity of my institute, which is exposing junk economics. I don't think it's necessary to um, oppose status solutions in order to address the uh, economics that is practiced uh, in favor of anti-global warming legislation. It's merely enough to talk about the silly public relations campaign that is advanced by the proponents of anti-global warming legislation under a patina of economic uh, analysis in order to discredit what they're about. I will also say I'm a little reluctant to carry on the uh, urinal analogy. I think we may have probably had enough of that, but um, I, I, I can't, I, it occurred to me as I was listening that actually my first encounter with a uh, self-flushing urinal was in Soviet Russia in Moscow right before the fall of communism. So I'm not entirely sure that, the, that uh, although I would also say that the uh, Soviet state had a, uh, made it unnecessary to actually post the restroom signs as you could find it uh, simply by following your nose. Uh, enough, of these, <laughs> enough of these comments. Um, let me uh, move on. I'm going to talk about, uh, again, public relations dressed up as economic science, and I begin by observing the existence of something called Enterprising Environmental Solutions, Inc., based in Pennsylvania. Its mission is described on the, on the screen, provide public information, exchange education, etc., to foster the expansion of economic and environmental opportunity. First, I ever heard of the concept of environmental opportunity, but we'll see what that means. Also, and here is the key, promote the idea that environmental protection and economic growth are not mutually exclusive, but mutually reinforcing goals. In other words, promoting the idea that we can have our cake and eat it too. I would, I would also ask you to listen to the stuff that we're getting on television now from at least two of the presidential candidates to the effect that uh, their platforms embrace a program for um, moving toward green policies and advancing the economy all at the same time. This is a, um, a, a particularly uh, effective way, apparently, of lying, uh, using economics to propagate lies. Now, uh, there's an organization part of the EESI called CCS Climate Change Strategies, and you can read the um, statement there. I focus on them because my think tank, uh, Beacon Illicit, has been traditionally focused at the state level, and thus we've been uh, taking on some of the uh, CCS activities in the states. Uh, they are, in effect, a, uh, an arm of EEI, AESI uh, that goes around the states uh, finding ideological allies, often in the legislature and the executive branch, and then uh, becoming enablers for the implementation of green legislation and it's a CS, CCS's job to provide uh, economic ammunition to f facilitate the passage of their agenda through the state, the bureaucracy, and legislature. Uh, here are a couple of their goals. Uh, by 2010, half the states will be on board. Um, what they propose, here are some of their ideas. I love, actually I love PowerPoints because I don't have to talk about things that I find obnoxious. I can just list them on the board, on the screen, and, and then you can go to my website eventually at beaconhill.org and have these slides if you'd like to have them. I'm happy to share them with you. Uh, but And here are some states. I'm sure it's only a partial list, uh, but this is the latest list that we got from uh, CCS that are considering climate change legislation. Uh, I'm sure they, of course, are aiming for 50 state participation. Now, I want to talk a little bit about cost-benefit analysis because CCS uh, includes as part of its portfolio of activities the performance of cost-benefit analysis. 
And uh, I, I like to talk about things like this because I like to talk about textbook economics. And this is the kind of economics that no serious economist disagrees with. Um, it, whether you uh, want to uh, do cost-benefit analysis or not is an interesting question, and, and some Austrian and public choice economists would debate whether you want to do it. But let's suppose we want to do it. And it's a well-documented methodology. Uh, what you do is you determine a stream of net benefits, which can be positive, negative, or zero. You choose a discount rate. You compute the present value of that stream of net benefits. And then if the present value is positive, the project's a good idea. If it's zero, you should be indifferent. If it's negative, you want to reject the pro project. It's really very simple. Uh, net benefits are benefits minus costs. Benefits are resources saved plus goods provided, costs or resources used, plus goods foregone. And again, net benefits at any moment over time can be greater than less than or equal to zero. Nothing, nothing controversial there. Uh, we did a, a cost-benefit analysis uh, on, on the uh, proposed 130 windmills that someone would build in Nantucket Sound. Uh, we did find that the, uh, the, the uh, net benefits were negative. The present value of the net benefits was a minus $209 million. Um, uh, some people have accused me of running a conservative think tank and are upset with us for reaching this conclusion since they think the 130 windmills all taller than the Statue of Liberty would be a perfectly delightful way to obscure Ted Kennedy's view of Nantucket <laughs> Sound. And I've had to live down a certain amount of criticism that I've gotten for reaching this uh, unfavorable finding on, um, on that particular project. But I, I put these uh, items here just so to give you an idea of the sort of standard thing that we do when we're uh, looking at this stuff. We, we, um, we, uh, do, we do find that there are some negative environmental effects as a result of obscuring the view of the sound and uh, interfering with the uh, sailboating and so on. Uh, but we also give credit for fuel saved and do we have capital costs that are saved uh, as a result of not having to build or maintain so many fossil fuel plants. And we even give some uh, credit for energy independence, uh, as we should. We try, to add, we try to discover all the benefits and all the costs and tally them up. And um, even though we were hired, I will disclose, by the opponents of the windmill project, we actually value our reputation more than we do a particular consulting project. So we really did try to get the numbers right. Now, the CCS has a problem here. Uh, and that is that the standard textbook cost-benefit methodology just won't work for them. And so they, in, in a rather um, haughty, um, superior way reject what they call standard benefit cost analysis as used in regulatory policy impact analysis. We're above all that. And in, in, this, in this approach that they reject, uh, one takes what they call a societal perspective and then tallies everything and quantifies where possible. You understand, this is the perspective that they reject, the societal perspective. Here I am, a uh, thoroughgoing red meat Republican, having to support a societal perspective. But if you're going to do cost-benefit analysis, you, by definition, must take a societal perspective. They find that inconvenient. And they also find it inconvenient to account for market imperfections or subsidies uh, and other sorts of uh, considerations that would get in the way of the results that they want to generate. In other words, what they engage in is what I would call junk economics. Now, they have a problem uh, justifying uh, their uh, legislation on the basis of cost-benefit analysis because they understand right off the bat that it doesn't generate any benefits that, are, that you can possibly measure. This is a problem. Uh, if the benefits are zero, what do you do? Well, they admit that the benefits can't be measured. Uh, how do you possibly measure a benefit of, say, the state of North Carolina adopting a couple of green, uh, green, uh, green energy initiatives uh, considering the magnitude of the worldwide problem. Uh, you can't really attach any monetary value, so they measure it in billions, megaton, million megatons of CO2 equivalent rather than dollar value. But if you don't assess dollars to the benefits, then the cost-benefit analysis collapses. They have a solution, though, for this problem. Uh, they admit that the benefits of all the proposed ideas are zero. Uh, but, but they understand the math. Net benefits equals then zero minus costs. So that all that is necessary now is to find the costs so that they become negative. So if you take zero and subtract, say, minus 10, you get plus 10. Thus, the net benefits turn out to be positive. This is important to understand when you read their stuff. 
You have to take this equation with the third bullet down, and you have to make sure that the cost item has a minus sign in front of it, so you'll get the desired outcome of a positive net benefit. Now, how do, how do they end up with uh, negative costs? Well, they say that uh, even when the uh, costs are negative, that, um, that, that uh, yeah, say, excuse me, that the costs are frequently negative because when you adopt their legislation, uh, things like this will happen. If, for example, you give free transit passes, if a firm is forced to give free transit passes to its workers, then the workers will take advantage of those transit passes, they will leave their cars at home, and uh, they will make it unnecessary, therefore, for the employer to provide a parking space. This then becomes a negative net benefit or a negative, excuse me, negative net cost or a positive benefit. Um, or in, if, if it were really lucky, giving the, um, uh, the uh, provided, providing sufficient encouragement to employers, they'll induce their employees not to come into the office at all and to engage in telecommuting, which will then uh, uh, remove the necessity of providing an office, thus providing a saving to the employer, which must then be counted as one of those negative net costs. Uh, never mind the possibility that productivity will, will be reduced if the employee is sitting at home in his pajamas rather than in the office actually interacting with the other people in the office. So you see what they have to go to in order to get to the conclusion that they want. Now, uh, a, uh, an, uh, an important question that we have to ask as we look at the studies that come from this source is the following. They will always make the argument that the legislation they support is going to save money by making business more efficient in the, in the way I just described. And similarly, it's going to save, the person going to save money by making it possible for people to reduce their fuel consumption in driving their cars. The question we must always ask when we're looking at this logic is why don't companies adopt these policies anyway, and why don't people demand these kinds of cars anyway, if in fact the net benefits of going in this direction are positive? Why do we need compulsory uh, activity from government in order to induce people with, to do what is manifestly in their own interest? Of course, this is never addressed, because as part of the CCS mindset, uh, choice is never an important consideration. There's never, never any uh, credit to be given to the idea that people make efficient choices without some sort of government inducement or uh, goading, and therefore there's no consideration given to what might be lost by goading people into uh, driving uh, cars that are fuel efficient but dangerous, goading people into staying home and working and not having the day-to-day -day interaction with their colleagues or goading people to take public transit and, uh, and suffering the inconveniences of that. Uh, another uh, element in the CCS methodology that cannot go unnoticed is that job creation is always a good thing. And I've discovered that I've, uh, again, prepared too long a slideshow, so I'm going to have to get to the point here. Um, job creation is not necessarily a good thing at all, of course. If you uh, create new jobs, by moving workers from less productive, uh, sorry, moving workers from more productive to less productive activities, then in fact what you are doing is you are reducing the uh, value of economic activity, not increasing it. Uh, it's always a mistake to point to job creation as such as a benefit unless you know whether the jobs that are being created actually add to the value of economic activity rather than reduce it by virtue of shifting the jobs from not so valuable activities from, excuse me, from more valuable activities to not so valuable activities. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the end of the story here, the bottom line is that these studies are so poorly done that they uh, need to be dismissed out of hand. They don't qualify benefits in a way that they can be meaningfully compared to costs. They misinterpret costs as benefits and they make unrealistic estimates of costs. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, have to go fairly quickly now. We did I have looked at three states. Uh, we've looked at Arizona, North Carolina, and Colorado. And um, we'll, uh, in Arizona, one of their recommendations was anti-idling ordinances. You should get a look at our slides later when you can take your time with them. Save $258 million, but they ignore program administration costs, enforcement costs, and they um, don't answer the question why they should omit those costs. Colorado Action Plan, billions and billions of dollars to be saved in the way that they suggest. I will, uh, I think some of these points I've already made. 
Uh, businesses are supposed to save on parking and office space by encouraging telecommuting. What if telecommunicating? What if telecommuting reduces productivity? Uh, no answer to that question. Uh, what if workers don't use the free transit passes that the employers are forced to give them? No answer to that question. Uh, they propose inverted block rates that would raise energy prices for high energy users, uh, thus inducing reduced energy uh, consumption. But what if the energy consumption has a value that is being ignored in this, in this so-called cost-benefit analysis that they're doing? North Carolina, here's a, list of, uh, here's a wish list for North Carolina. I'll let, let you skim that. I, thank goodness, I, now I'm down to two minutes. Uh, if you dig into the weeds of this in North Carolina, a study they have in, in a return on investment in infrastructure that ranges from 50% to 2,300%. Uh, I would really wish somebody could show me a stock that I could buy that would just give me 5%. But, uh, but, 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 but see, the, the interesting thing is that this kind of nonsense generally goes unchallenged, and it isn't really hard work. I'm, I'm happy to make a living out of just poking holes in this kind of nonsense. Um, they, 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 would, they would, in effect, argue that the more infrastructure we create around the concept of green energy, uh, the more we will get in the way of social benefits, that there are no diminishing returns at all to this kind of investment. Uh, we are about to build some, uh, some very complicated models that, are, uh, that we hope will actually show the uh, negative effects on the economy uh, for two states, starting out North Carolina and South Carolina. And I just want to jump to... Um, I want to jump to this slide uh, because I, I saw an article just minutes before I came here by uh, Morton Weitzman, who actually makes an argument that I, I think was, we should read uh, on why we should take uh, climate change seriously. Uh, he, he, he revealingly points out that climate change as a threat to humanity has to be considered along with uh, such things as asteroid impacts. Um, Catastrophes that might result from uh, biohazards such as man-eating tomatoes. Um, uh, I would also want to put Islamic Jihad in the category of potential catastrophes. And, and since I do have some statist impulses, I'm not opposed to looking at these potential catastrophes from a societal point of view involving international discussion. But the one thing that we have to resist is using junk economics in order to defend and to, per, per, in order to perpetrate what really amounts to a public relations campaign aimed at enabling the rent seekers who will benefit from this kind of legislation. Thank you very much.